As an anthropology student, I've heard many of my peers scoff at the fact that my area of concentration is linguistics. I'm honestly intrigued by how difficult it's perceived to be, and I love to try to convince people otherwise. Yeah, actual linguistic knowledge is used to some extent, but linguistic anthropology is all about the influential attributes that language has in the social life. Language is used to understand the different perspectives that other cultures have of the world. Identities, knowledge, history, other heritage information can all be extracted through linguistic anthropological studies. It's so great! Now, because of the multitude of intricate concepts that come along with the discipline naturally, um, the first tiny film strip of the bigger picture is grasping a solid foundation on how people actually think about language, or how we say, language ideology. Linguistic anthropologist Paul Crossgritty describes language ideology as a cluster concept consisting of a number of converging dimensions with several overlapping um, but analytically distinguishable layers of significance. In other words, language ideology can be paired with different concepts to create other paths of understanding and explaining uh, other viewpoints, particular viewpoints like language attitude, semiotics, globalism, language policy, language planning. They all have a major impact on the linguistic future and can be applied to either the survival or decline of a language. The common elements of language ideologies incorporate the power structures associated with the relationships between language, its users, and their territories. Since the discipline surge in interest during the 80s and 90s, two main categories have been definitely defined by social scientists, the monoglossic approach and the pluralist approach. Imagine picture frames on a wall that represent the different areas of anthropological studies. Language as a frame coincides with the cohesive nature of culture that's used as a puzzle piece to the feng shui of it all. To me, the language frame is obviously the prettiest. Now, when we focus on the image inside of the frame, it's not a traditional picture of sorts where you have just one moment in time captured for all eternity, but rather a moving image that doesn't stay the same for long. Think of it in a way of taking a bike ride on a sunny day down a path through a forest, but not knowing exactly where you'll end up. The bike is shifty, but that's what the language users have to ride. The sun has a vast amount of power to shine its rays even through the thickest of forest. The rays are the many other attributes that help to continue on a certain course ahead. But when the language user starts to look at the mesmerizing thickets around them, they potentially could be led down a different path. The influence of the sun helps to confirm the forward movements, while the inclination towards a certain forest determines where they'll end up. I understand that this analogy may not be the easiest to uh, follow or even for me to explain. However, all of the minute details, they all correlate to the potential possibilities of endpoints. The, they go together, the language users and their ideologies, they influence each other um, to further the undeniable eventual shift in linguistics. Monoglossic growth guides us into the normative stance that takes on the intention of constriction to social autonomy. Usually used in educational departments and national policies with the attempt to homogenize common identity. As Alexander Jaffe puts it, language was connected to a moral order. These views tend to privilege involvement and social retention of monolinguals while negating that of non-normative monolinguals and bilinguals. These views are historically known to be deeply rooted in the cultural apathetic nature of power holders and their followers. Pluralist Park takes us to a viewpoint that promotes and encourages linguistic diversity in social context. However, some still embrace parts of normative monolingualism in the aspect of strict separation of languages within each social sector. For example, bilingual education, 
where there is a value and advocacy of usage of two or more languages. However, the educational setting serves systematic splits between the languages. Subcategories of pluralist viewpoints are still determined in a socially dominant way, but tend to include the understanding of beneficial ties to those multilingual abilities. The shifty bicycle will always move forward while potentially taking different paths. The path can either be that of maintenance way, revival alley, or death row. Any of which, regardless, depend on the implementation of action as prescribed by the language user collective as the prime steering mechanism. These forests don't stand alone and cannot survive without the nutrients given to them by the outside clout. That's to say that language ideologies are perpetuated by those in the power holding sectors of society. Language is power, but ideologies are so much more powerful. Again, I completely understand that these concepts are super abstract and I absolutely don't blame anyone for not wanting to pursue this as a career. However, I really hope that I help to break down a barrier or two with my explanation of this fundamental element of linguistic anthropology. Language ideologies are super, super fascinating because everybody has a story. So. Go out and ask someone about theirs.